Well, now we've come to the second of the four steps to freedom, of the four parts of being born again, and this is the most important of them all, namely faith. The first step was repenting toward God, and the second step is believing in the Lord Jesus. These little words are very important in the Word of God. The word in here is crucial. How many of you believe in me? Could I see, please? Just raise your hand if you believe in me. I see your hand, sister. <laughs> One, two, three. Only half a dozen. How many of you believe that I exist? Could I see? You see, if you word the appeal right, you get a bigger response. <laughs> But you see, all of you believe that I exist. Some of you apparently believe in me, but even those who put their hands up, I don't know if they do or not. I have no way of telling whether that profession of faith meant that they possessed faith in me. If those who raise their hands would like to give me all their money at the end of this afternoon, I will look after it for five years for you and return it to you every penny with interest. Now, if you do that, I will know you believe in me. You cannot know that a person believes in you until they have done something that shows they trust you and have taken a risk that you will let them down. Do you follow me? Believing in someone is totally different from believing that someone is or is something. And it's believing in the Lord Jesus that is the second part of being born again. So let's spell out what faith is. And the first thing about faith we need to say is that faith is historical. What do I mean by that? I mean it is based on facts and not on feelings. It's based on certain events which happened, and it doesn't matter how long ago they happened, they happened. And we are putting our faith in the facts of history. We're not believing because we feel it's true, but because it is true, because the evidence is there, as for every other event in history. There is another kind of faith that's going the rounds now, which I call faith in faith. I wonder if you know what I mean. Years ago, we had a problem with people putting their faith in feelings, and they only felt they believed now and again, or they felt they were a believer on Sunday night, and they didn't feel they were a believer on Monday morning. But the facts haven't changed from Sunday night to Monday morning. But nowadays, there are a lot of people putting faith in faith doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it. You know, name it, claim it. I believe it, it's mine, sort of thing. Our faith is not in feelings. It is not in faith. We don't believe in having faith. We believe in facts. And the three facts that are at the heart of our faith are that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he was raised. Don't miss out on the middle one. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3, I delivered to you what is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Three facts. The burial is as important as the death and the resurrection. But I've heard many preachers talk about the cross, Many people talk about the empty tomb. Hardly a preacher I've heard has ever talked about the burial. There has never been a Christian creed without that vital inclusion. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Buried. Jesus didn't rise from death. He rose from the burial. He rose from the grave. And if Jesus was not buried, then our faith will suffer. And if he was not raised, whatever bishops say, if he was not raised from the dead with a body, then we've wasted our time becoming Christians. These are facts, and the evidence for them is as good as for any other fact in history. Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. And people need to know those three facts. 
if their faith is going to have a solid foundation. No one can put Jesus on a cross again. No one can put him in the tomb again. No one can raise him again. Those have happened, and they will never happen again. And our faith is in that part of history. That's the first thing we need to make sure of. That means that Christian faith is exclusive. It is pinned to those events. It's not a general belief in God. There are other religions have faith in God. It's a faith in those three events and their significance. Now the second thing about faith that we need to communicate to people is that faith is personal. You may believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, but faith also needs to be in Jesus. It is intensely personal. It is trusting in a person and obeying a person. It is not just believing certain things happen to that person, it is directly risking your life with that person and trusting him. That's taking it a little further than a purely historical faith. You see, Satan has number one faith. The devils know perfectly well that Jesus died. They know that he was buried. They know that he rose again. But they don't become believers. It says that the most Satan becomes is a Quaker. Did you know the Bible said that? It says the demons believe that God is one and they tremble, which is the origin of the word Quaker. So even though they tremble at the facts, they don't become believers because they will not put their trust in the person to whom these things happened. So we need to help people not just to believe in the historical facts of the gospel, that's the first step, but to know they can actually relate personally to the person to whom they happened. No other religion has such an offer or a claim. Muhammad is dead and his tomb is still full. Buddha is dead and his tomb is still full. Confucius is dead and his tomb is still full. And Jesus is alive and his tomb is empty. That's the difference. And therefore I can't have a personal relationship with Muhammad or with Confucius or with Buddha. But the essence of Christian faith is that I can trust Jesus personally. And until we get to that personal dimension, we haven't touched real faith. We must get the historical facts over, but then we say, now the person to whom that all happened is a person you can talk to and relate to and know as your own friend. The third dimension in faith is a verbal dimension. Just as repentance becomes words at a certain stage, faith also needs to be expressed in words. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So it is of the essence of faith to say so, to put it into words, and somehow when you really believe something, you're prepared to say it. Now there are two ways in which faith becomes verbal. First, in talking to Jesus. If you really believe Jesus is alive, that you can know him and have a personal relationship to him, you can talk to him. Which is why the New Testament emphasizes, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling on the Lord is putting your faith into words and say, Jesus, help me, save me, I need you. It's to talk directly to him. So that the first verbal expression of faith is to talk to the Lord, to call on him, to call on his name. And there's something about using a person's name 
that makes all the difference. I remember a Jewish girl coming to me after a service in Cambridgeshire, uh, an attractive Jewess, and she said this to me. She said, are you trying to say that Jesus of Nazareth is still alive? I said, you got the message, that's what I'm saying. She said, then if he is, he must be our Messiah. I like the word our there, not yours. <laughs> Ours, that was a true Jew speaking. If he is, he must be our Messiah. I said, that's right. She said, how could I find out if he's alive? I said, you could try talking to him right now. She did, and she did. And within 10 minutes, she was teaching me the Bible. It was all in her blood. She knew the scriptures from end to end. Her whole Jewish background had given her all the truth except the one key that would unlock it all, and that was the key, Jesus is alive. It's the only thing a Jew or Jewess needs to know to believe in Jesus, that he's alive. That's what happened to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. That's what will happen to the entire Jewish nation when they look on him whom they have pierced. But she talked to him and she found out she was calling on the name of the Lord. She was exercising faith by talking to someone. If you believe he's alive and that you can know him and relate to him, then the first expression of that faith is to call on his name and say, Jesus, I'm talking to you. Jesus, if you're there, Jesus, I need help. That's how most people begin to exercise their faith, verbally. But there's another side to it, and that is to talk about Jesus. One of the best things a new believer can do is to tell someone else they've believed in Jesus. Somehow that strengthens their faith. They're confessing with their mouth in front of unbelievers. It's amazing what it does for you to go and say to an unbeliever, do you know, I believe in Jesus now. I'm a Jesus man, a Jesus woman. So the verbal dimension of faith is very important in its two aspects of talking to Jesus and talking about him. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I can confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, you embarrass me and I will have to deny you before my Father. So if you claim to believe in Jesus and you're too embarrassed to say so, there's something weak in your faith. But when you say so, how many of you found out that when you talk about Jesus to others, your own faith gets stronger? Isn't that right? Because it's a verbal dimension of faith coming out. Now the fourth dimension of faith, faith is very practical. It is something you do. It's not just what you think or what you say, just as repentance starts with what you think and moves to what you say and then moves to your deeds, thought, word, deed, faith does the same thing. We think about the gospel we've heard, becomes words, but it must become deeds. Now James chapter 2 is one of the most important chapters in the New Testament. He says, faith without works is dead, it cannot save. And people have often thought, Martin Luther thought, that James and Paul were contradicting each other. Paul says a man is justified by faith and not by works. James says faith without works is dead and cannot save. It's no better than a cadaver in a mortuary. Now who's right, Paul or James? The answer is they're both right. They're using the word works in a different way. Paul, when he said works, meant works of the law, good deeds, whereas James is talking about works of faith, and that's a different thing. The word works is what is throwing us, and I prefer the new international version. Some people call it the nearly infallible version, the NIV. I prefer its translation of actions rather than works, where James says, faith without actions is dead. If you really believe in someone, you show it in your actions. Now, my wife showed it when I was piloting a little plane in New Zealand, and she stayed there quite calm to my amazement. 
while I was flying the plane. She believed in me by not strapping on a parachute and jumping for the exit, though I think she'd have found that even more unnerving. If you get into my car while I'm driving, that's an action of faith. There are two people I know, I won't give you their names for anything. I will not get into their cars. <laughs> I do not believe in them, and I just do not trust them. And Some of you would know one of them, so I'm not going to mention any names. But if you believe in someone, you show it. You believe in the doctor when you put your life in the hands of a surgeon and sign the papers I did a few years ago. And a surgeon I'd never seen before. I was taken ill in the middle of a meeting and was in agony and a surgeon said, I will operate at midnight. It's needed. But you don't know me. He said, I'll put you in an ambulance and send you back home if you've got a doctor there that you trust. But he said, I'm willing to do it at midnight tonight. And I talked to them and looked at him. And though I'd never met him before, I said, I trust you and I'll, I'll sign the paper. And I put my life in his hands. And here I am. So he did a reasonable job. But I, I believed in him. Therefore, I signed the paper and put my life in his hands. That's what faith is. It's practical. I wonder if you can remember when you last believed in Jesus. Now think that question through. When did you last believe in Jesus? When did you last take a risk in which you'd have fallen flat on your face if Jesus wasn't there to catch you? When did you last act in faith? Because the only faith the New Testament recognizes is faith that acts. The tragedy is, of course, in this country, life is so secure and comfortable that we rarely need to act in faith. Some church members haven't acted in faith for months. They haven't needed to. And some only try and act in faith when cancer strikes or when some big emergency tackles. But they've been so used to living without acting in faith that when the big crunch comes, they haven't got enough faith to tackle it. They haven't been living by faith because they don't need to. We've got doctors and dentists and lawyers and shops full of food in this country. We don't need to live by faith half the time. When did you last believe in Jesus? You say, oh, I, I've always believed in Jesus. No, you haven't. Sometimes you've gone weeks without believing in Jesus. Oh, you've always believed that he was your Savior and that he was Lord. But when did you last believe in Jesus and trust him for something? That's practical faith. We used to play a game called faith with our three children. And I can see them now standing five steps up the staircase in a row. And I was standing at the foot of the staircase with hands like this. And they would say, Daddy, if we jump, will you catch us? And I would say, I might. I might not. And they would stand there swaying and shaking with dreadful anticipation. It was their equivalent of video nasties, I think. <laughs> and that they would stand with fear. And then one of them would jump and I would catch them. Then another would jump. We called the game Faith. This is how we taught them. You don't believe in someone till you jump and they catch you. Well, now we've stopped playing that game now. Haven't played it for some years. For health reasons. <laughs> My health. <laughs> They're all bigger than I am now, so we don't play it anymore. But they learned the lesson and they love that game. I must tell you the funny story of a man walking across a dark field on a foggy night. And he didn't know there was a cliff at the edge of the field and he fell right over. And he's hurtling down this deep ravine, his arms flailing, and he caught the branch of a tree that was growing out of a cliff. And he grabbed it with his other hand and he's hanging there in the darkness and the fog, wondering how far it is to the bottom. And he shouted up, is there anyone there? And a deep voice in the cloud said, yes, my son, I am here. He said, can you get me out of this? And he said, yes, if you have faith. What do I have to do to have faith? Let go of the branch. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> that story says it all. Faith's when you let go. Faith's when you jump. Faith's when you take the risk. Faith is when you act on the Word of God. 
Unfortunately, many evangelicals particularly think that faith is accepting the truth of God's Word. It isn't. It's acting on the truth of God's Word. Plenty of people accept the truth of the Bible without ever acting on it. But it's people who act on the truth of God's Word who have faith. And James 2 gives us two startling examples, shows it's nothing to do with moral quality, because one example is of a prostitute, Rahav, and the other was a man called Avraham. And the prostitute Rahav, who became an ancestress of Jesus, showed faith when she hid the spies in Jericho and got them safely out of the city. And Abraham showed faith when he took his only son, who was in his early thirties, and took him to Mount Maria, where later another father put his son to death and offered that son as a sacrifice, risking the entire future of his family. Both of those people risked their whole future and acted on God's Word. Look at Hebrews 11. You know that chapter that begins by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Every illustration of faith in that chapter is of what somebody did. Whether it was Noah building an ark, or Moses taking them across the Red Sea, or Gideon, or Barak, or Samson, every example of faith in that chapter is what they did. They acted in faith. They believed God meant what he said, and they acted accordingly. That was faith. It wasn't that they believed every word of the Old Testament. It was that they acted on what God had said. And this is probably one of the most important things we need to communicate to people. Faith is not saying you agree with the Scripture. Faith is not saying you accept the Scripture. Faith comes when you act on the Scripture. And the fourth one is even more controversial, perhaps, and yet very important, that we tell people that faith is continual. It's not those who start in faith who are saved, it's those who finish in faith who are saved. Now there's a thought. I'm sure one of you is going to come up afterwards and say, what about once saved, always saved? A phrase I can't find in my Bible. What I find in the Bible is that faith is continual. The word faith and the word fidelity or faithfulness are the same word in Greek and Hebrew. Did you know that? To have faith is to be faithful. To trust someone is to go on trusting them. In other words, it's keeping faith in someone that is real faith. Going on believing when everything seems to contradict your faith and you still trust him. There were three men in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Interbedigo, or something like that. And those three men were thrown into a fiery furnace, and they were challenged, do you believe that God can save you from that fiery furnace? They said, we do believe that. But even if he doesn't, we'll still go on trusting him. But if not, isn't that wonderful? What a phrase of faith. But if not, that won't affect my faith. I still trust him. Now this is why the verb believe in the New Testament, here's something you wouldn't know if you don't know Greek. There are certain tenses of verbs in the Greek language which are a little difficult to get into English. And one of those tenses is called the present continuous tense. We don't have it in English. So to translate it into English, you have to add two little words, go on to go on doing something, they would use the present continuous tense. Now Jesus did not say, ask and you'll receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. What he actually said was this, go on asking and you will receive, go on seeking and you will find, go on knocking and the door will be open to you. Does that make a difference? A big difference. Somebody says, I once asked for the Holy Spirit and nothing happened. Oh, you only asked once? Jesus said, go on asking. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? 
present continuous tense again. Now listen to a verse that you know only too well, properly translated. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Has that changed that verse for you all of a sudden? It should have done. Whoever goes on believing. It's not a moment of faith, it's a lifetime of faith that saves. My faith of yesterday won't save me today. And my faith of today won't save me tomorrow. Like salvation itself, faith is a continual thing. And it has this element of keeping faith in it, of going on trusting. The Bible talks about those who make shipwreck of faith, those who depart from the faith, those who don't keep it up. And those warnings are very strong and very severe and very clear. Paul, in the middle of his life, did not trust in the faith he had on the road to Damascus. He said, the life I now live, I live by faith. And when he reached the end of his earthly pilgrimage, he didn't say, thank God for my conversion on the Damascus Road. What he said was, I have finished the course. I have fought the fight. I've kept the faith. There's a verse in Hebrews 11, which is one of my favorites. It says, after mentioning Moses and Noah and all the heroes of faith, it says this, all these were still living by faith when they died. Isn't that a marvelous statement? They were still living by faith when they died. And therefore it says, you run your race looking to Jesus, the one who begins your faith and the one who finishes it. The author and the finisher, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Keep it up. Go on trusting. Die in faith after living in faith. Now we need to communicate this because so many think that just one moment of faith, you've got your ticket to glory. No, it's a life of faith because Jesus wants to save you every day from your sins, from yourself. And it's only the faith of today that saves me today. Now there's one other proof of this. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is a key phrase. The just shall live by faith. It became the Magna Carta of the Protestant Reformation. Let's go back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk was having an argument with God. He said, God, you're doing nothing about the evil in Jerusalem. You're doing nothing about the wickedness in, in your own people. And God said, Habakkuk, I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring the Babylonians to invade Jerusalem and destroy all these evil people of mine. Then Habakkuk argued from the opposite viewpoint. He said, you're not going to destroy them all, Lord. If the Babylonians come, nobody will be left. They just kill everybody. And there are some good people around. Surely you're not going to let the righteous die as well as the wicked. And God said, Habakkuk, the righteous will live by faith. And the word faith only occurs three times in the Old Testament. And it always means faithfulness. It always means to go on trusting someone. It's used of a marriage that stays together. And what God is saying to Habakkuk is this, those who go on trusting me will not be destroyed when the Babylonians come. And that little phrase, the just shall survive by keeping faith, which is the literal translation, is used by three writers in the New Testament. They quote Habakkuk. And every time the emphasis, the point of their quotation, is on the continuity of faith. Listen to Paul. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who goes on believing. Present continuous tense. For it is faith from first to last even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Did you notice the phrase, faith from first to last? Or take Hebrews 10, Habakkuk is quoted there too, and Hebrews 10 says this, We are not among those 
who shrink back, meaning into our old life, and are lost. We are among those who go unbelieving and are saved. As it is written, the just shall live by keeping faith. The whole emphasis we need to communicate people to you is this. It's not this step of faith or this decision of faith that saves you. You are now starting a life of faith. And as you go on trusting the Lord, you will go on being saved and you will never perish. That's what my New Testament says. It's a life of faith that saves. That makes sense of all the texts like, he who endures to the end shall be saved. That makes sense of Paul's solemn warning, you Gentile believers don't get proud because the Jews were cut off. Because if you do not continue in God's kindness, you too will be cut off. These are solemn warnings. And every New Testament writer gives us a warning not to let go of your faith, not to lose your confidence in God but to go on trusting him. So faith is a continual thing. Now how are we going to help people into faith if that's what it is? Well, we shall help them in the first thing by telling them the facts. Obviously, until they know what happened, then they can't believe it. And we need to give them the evidence if they require it. Now, I know that some people just raise objections to the gospel because they want to be awkward. And you find that if you answer one objection, they've floated over here to another one. Do you know that kind of person? They don't really want their questions answered and they just flit from one objection to another. Don't waste time with them. But there are genuine people who want to know, did these things actually happen? What evidence is there that Jesus rose from the dead? Now we have a duty to give a reason for the hope that is in us. And one of the books I found most helpful for this is a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. There's no book I've ever read that has so much hard, concrete evidence for the facts of the gospel as this. It's a factual book. And I don't see how anybody could read a book like this and not believe in the historical facts of the gospel on which our faith is based. We have a duty to help people. They've probably heard all kinds of things about Christianity that are not true. We need to be able to teach them the truth and answer their questions. To make it personal, we need to be able to let them see the gospel as well as hear it. And here we're touching something a little different. There are two ways in which we need to show them the gospel. You know, when Jesus sent the apostles out two by two, he said, very simply, all you've got to do is this. Go to the nearest town, raise the dead, heal the leper. That's like cleansing AIDS. Re heal the sick, cast out demons, and then tell them the kingdom's come. That's all they've got to do. That's all we've got to do. Simple, isn't it? The principle is, show them first, then let them hear it. Give it to them in the eye. Give them one in the eye first, and one in the ear second. Demonstrate the kingdom, then declare it. And you know what we try to do? We try to do it all with words. We tell them the gospel, but we don't show them how it affects people personally. Oh, my time is running away, so I haven't time to tell you of the meeting where my wife was sitting down where she's sitting now, and the Lord told me to demonstrate his kingdom to 1,500 young people by curing dandruff in the name of the Lord Jesus. I just felt an idiot. And I got up and I said, I want you to see that Jesus is in control of every situation, and the first thing he's going to demonstrate this to you is through dandruff. And her face said it all. Her face said, he's finally flipped. <laughs> I've been expecting it for years and now it's happened. She, that's what she, she told me afterwards. She admitted that's what was happening. But the Lord started that day by healing dandruff. He went on to healing a withered hand, a girl who'd never been able to use her right hand. 
I've always been left-handed with a right-handed brain which set up nervous stress, wrote to her parents an hour later, Dear Mum and Dad, I'm writing with my right hand. Finished with a boy who had a paralyzed left arm and hand from a car accident when he was two, and he'd been trying to saw logs with a petrol-driven chainsaw with one hand, and he just took his knee right off. They rushed him to hospital, saved his life with blood transfusion, but joined the bone of his lower leg to his upper leg, so he had a short stump. And he arrived at this youth camp on crutches with a paralyzed arm and a short stumpy leg, seven weeks after the accident. And on the Thursday afternoon of that youth camp, that boy ran with both arms and legs working from one end of the sports field to the other came back into the barn where we were holding meetings, sitting on hay bales, and jumped up on a pile of hay bales and danced for all these 1,500 young people to see. And then he said, I'm going to tell you the whole truth and you can laugh if you like. He said, I came to this camp a bed wetter. I had to bring a rubber sheet because I wet the bed twice a night. And he said, the Lord's dealt with that too and you can laugh if you like. Those young people saw the gospel. They didn't just hear about the history of it, they saw what it can do for an individual person. Not only do they need to see the signs, we need to show them the deeds of a changed life. Nietzsche, the philosopher behind Adolf Hitler, once said this, I would want to be saved if Christians looked more saved. If he'd seen changed people we might never have had Adolf Hitler, but he didn't see them. Mohammed knew Christians, but he didn't see changed lives. How much trouble that would have avoided. Now listen, we make it personal when we show them, when we let them see what a difference it can make to individuals. We, make it, we help them to be verbal by encouraging them to pray to Jesus themselves I discourage the use of repeated prayers, of the so-called sinner's prayer. Far better tell a person, you pray for yourself to Jesus, and if you listen to their words, you'll find out where they are. But there's too much now, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I come to you now, I come to you now. That is not calling on the name of the Lord. Encourage them to express their own I love to hear new Christians' prayers, don't you? They're so unchurchy. You don't get just prayers from new Christians. Do you know what I mean? Lord, we just come to you and just ask you to just bless and to just heal and to just come and meet us just in this meeting and just... Have you heard just prayers? You never get them from new Christians. Only old Christians or er uh, prayers. Lord, er, uh, we come to you tonight, er, uh, and we ask you, er, uh, to bless us, er. Uh. Have you heard er uh, prayers? Oh, we get so hidebound in our ritualism, don't we? But encourage new Christians to pray for themselves and teach them to set goals of faith. Say, now let's take a problem you have, let's take a need you have, let's believe together for that, and then you'll know that you have faith when you see the result for that. Start with something small within their faith. Start with dandruff. If we can't, Heal dandruff in the name of Jesus. What's the point of praying about cancer? So start with something real, something small, something within the reach of their faith. And finally, we've got to urge them to go on believing, to encourage them to believe every day, to find some way of trusting Jesus, stretching themselves so that they find themselves doing things they could never do. Well, my 40 minutes has gone on faith. There's much more to say on faith. But uh, we'll have to leave it there, and the next talk will be on baptism in water and how that relates to being born again and entering the kingdom of heaven on earth.